Hey, good morning. Peacemaking or making peace. It seems pretty straightforward and yet uh, not very easy to do. But Jesus talked about it in the Beatitudes and he connected it with something else. He said the blessing of peacemaking is that you'll be called a child of God. What's he mean by that? Well, we're going to talk about that in just about 12 minutes, I think is about the time. Hi, I'm Jack Starr, and this is the November 15th service of the United Methodist Church of Osceola, Wisconsin. Welcome. Join us in singing. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. That's good. I always think it's good. Maybe not always think it's good. It's nice to do that twice in case you aren't quite ready for the first one. Gives you a chance to warm up a little bit. Let's join in praying our, um, our call to worship and our centering prayer together. Eternal God, in our joy and our sorrow, you see us and you call us to you. We open our hearts to you. So guide our thoughts and awaken us to your spirit. Help us to realize and embrace the joy that we can find in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us join together in singing that great hymn. I'll sing it here. I invite you to sing it wherever you may be. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Uh, you'll find the words of it on your screen. And so invite you to join with singing along with us. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to the feet your tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, evermore God's praises sing. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the everlasting. Praise the Lord for grace and favor to all people in distress. Praise God still the same forever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Alleluia, alleluia. Glorious now God's faithfulness. Father, like God tends and spares us, well our feeble frame God knows. Mother, like God gently bears us, 
rescues us from all our foes. Alleluia, alleluia, widely as God's mercy flows. Angels in the heights adoring, you behold God face to face. Saints triumphant now adoring, gathered in from every race. Alleluia, alleluia, plays with us the God of grace. Amen. I, I love that song, and it's got two very great tunes, and you can kind of mix them up or find them one way or the other. But the, but the words of praise and thanksgiving, and I just, you know, grace is such a great thing. I love this song, brings it up a lot, and so it's good to have that. We're going to take some time to pray as a church, and um, as we pray, um, I... Uh, as we're here on the internet, I don't list all of the names of those um, who we've, we've heard about who have prayer needs this week. Uh, a lot of you have received it in the newsletter, in the bulletin for this Sunday. Um, I'm going to give us, though, I'm going to lead us in a guided prayer. And I'm going to give you a little bit of space. And, and as I do, I invite you to lift up in your own hearts all of those that... that uh, you might name that you might be thinking of particular needs and know that all of us wherever we might be over the internet and and here in uh, in our worship center uh, all of us are joining our prayers with you so let us join together in prayer gracious God thank you for your love thank you for your presence in our lives thank you that when we talk to you, we don't have to talk out loud this way. We can whisper it. We can even just say it in our own minds and you know you hear. In fact, you know, you know our thoughts before we utter them. You know our needs before we might speak them. You understand what's going on in our hearts. And you know every bit of uncertainty, every bit of doubt, every bit of hope that we bring to our prayers. And yet, God, we give you thanks. We praise you because you are ever faithful. You're on our side, no matter how we come to you. We come to you, Lord, requesting your great power, your, your love, your healing, your strength, your spirit, to be poured out on, on us and on these loved ones who we lift up to you this morning. And so, Lord, we lift up to you all those who have suffered loss. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray, Lord, for all those who have died those who are facing imminent death, and we pray for the families. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray for all those who are ill, who are facing procedures, who are recovering from procedures, those who are recovering from illnesses, those who are struggling with chronic conditions, all of those whose physical well-being is in question. We pray for your healing. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray for those who are facing uncertainty. Maybe it's economic uncertainty. Maybe it's social uncertainty. There is something that, that people don't know. There are Expected things did not come to pass. And so the future is uncertain. Lord, in your love, 
Hear this, our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer, who are in danger from fire and flood, from famine, disasters and disease, from violence. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who serve, especially in this particular time. Those who serve in our schools, whether they're in person or online. Those who are our police and firefighters and EMTs. Lord, we pray for those who are serving now in emergency rooms and ICUs and in our medical community. So many of them are shorthanded and they're right on the front lines against this disease. We lift them all up to you. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. And Lord, we pray especially this past week, it was Veterans Day, and we pray for those who serve in the armed forces. We pray for those veterans who have served, and we pray that they will be kept, um, that they will receive the services that have been promised, that all will be kept safe and blessed. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray for our leaders, leaders in our government, leaders of our communities, our businesses, our institutions, our organizations, our thought leaders, all of those who shape our world. Give them wisdom and your guidance. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. And Lord, we pray for your church, for your people around the world. Some are in danger, some are facing persecution, and yet, Lord, your church is there to make a difference, is to bring your blessing to the far-flung corners of the world. Give them strength, Lord. Give them hope and encouragement, and bless all of those, your children, your people who are serving you wherever they may be. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for your blessings, for your answers to prayer. We give you thanks that, that we have been touched by your presence. And so we pray as those who have been blessed that we might be blessings to others. Um, th those in our own family, so many times we are shortest with those who we are quarantined with. But those in our communities, however we may contact them, um, whether it be in person, hopefully keeping safely social distanced and masked and all, um, whether it be over the internet, yes, Lord, your grace can flow over the internet. Let us be ways to do that. Over the telephone lines, let us share our grace, your grace, um, through our words on the phone. However we might be used, Lord, we pray that you will use us to spread your kingdom, your peace, your grace, your goodness throughout our world. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to do this because we are your children. And we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive those who have, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
That's the one you do when you've prayed it so many times that you screw it up as soon as you're leading other people. So I'm sure you know the Lord's Prayer well enough that you just kept doing it right even when I screwed up the words. So uh, God bless you. Hey, I mentioned about peacemaking. We are um, drawing to the near of to near to the end of a series that um, that I'm calling the manifesto of God's kingdom. Uh, it's it's a, a series of messages that are on the sayings of Jesus that we call the Beatitudes. Uh, these are the way Jesus starts out his great sermon that's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Each one of them, um, each one of these Beatitudes starts out by declaring how happy or how fortunate or how blessed are, are these particular people who are named. The only thing is, is that when they're actually named, they're quite often people who we would least expect to see there. We find ourselves needing to look at things in a way differently than we have ever looked at them before. Maybe that's a good reason that we should let Jesus' words provoke us into looking at them a little bit deeper. And so this week what we're looking at are the, are the words of this phrase, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I want to read the passage that they come from. We've been reading from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, right at the beginning of it. And I'm reading it today from the New International Version. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And today's blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. He goes on. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God give his blessing to the hearing and understanding of this portion of of scripture. Thanks be to God. So Jesus' teaching in what we call the Sermon on the Mount begins with this announcement of blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. And today, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then there's one more that we'll deal with next week. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. We'll, we'll get to that next week. But I, I wanted to mention through all of these, because maybe you haven't noticed that there is a progression, actually, through these Beatitudes. They're not a random list of nice things that we're supposed to do. If they were simply a, a grocery list of behaviors that we were supposed to enact, well then actually what Jesus has done is simply give us another list of things to do and another list of people who were blessed because they got it right. But we already know that. It's not news. I mean, we know that the morally upright people are blessed. It's, it's the same structure we've been living with forever. But there's a flow that happens here, and we've been dealing with some of them as, as we've moved into it. So the first four here, poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, the hungry, the first four beatitudes actually refer to conditions. If you're poor in spirit, if you're meek, if you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness, those sorts of things, they're conditions. They are about how God interacts with us. God blesses us when we find ourselves in that condition. The second four have a little different feel. 
They're about how we interact with others. Merciful to others will receive mercy. How we are pure in the heart, how we're showing integrity and, and being exactly who you see. You know, what you see is what you get. All of those who are how we interact with others. The first four deal with how God meets us. The next four deal with how we meet God. And so they, they build on it because when God meets us in our brokenness, in our failure, in our sin, and when we experience the grace of God at our lowest points, which is how, how Jesus describes some of those characters who receive blessing, once we've received that, it gets really hard for us to be judgmental of other people who are also at their lowest point. We can, we can no longer relate to others in exactly the same way as we did before. Now we'll have more of the desire and the will and the motivation and the capacity to, to show mercy, uh, to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers. Remember that this all started with Jesus making an announcement, an unexpected announcement of blessing to those who had no reason to expect such grace. To the pathetic, the grieving, the losers, those who were so aware of their lack of justice and righteousness in themselves and in the world that they ached for it, they longed for it, that they craved it. Well, Jesus entered into that ache with them. He looked at the ache. He touched it, embraced it. He shared that ache with them and felt it and he really knew it. Jesus began his announcement here by addressing those aching ones, and that's us. Oh yeah, we try to hide it. The things that, that haunt us, we, those unresolved things in our own lives, because they're there, even though we try to hide them. And, and, and we try to, oh, sometimes place them on someone else. It happens all the time. Sometimes we call it projection, that we take our own fears and, and we place them on another person. Sometimes the energy that we put into labeling and ostracizing and condemning and excluding other people reveals the true nature of the fear in us. Well, the Beatitudes are announcements um, that it is in those places, those exact places that God meets us, redeems us, forgives us, and announces to us that we are blessed. And when God has met us there in that place, things change. We can't see the world in the same way when the divine, when, when God in all God's glory and grace and goodness has come to us in those, our lowest moments. We can't keep up the story that we're the good ones and those other people out there, they're the screwed up ones because God's been there, found us in our most screwed upness. That's where God met us. So this announcement of blessing gives great evidence of the grace and love that, well, it's such great evidence that we realize we don't have to be afraid. The powerful work of God in our lives, the grace that God has expressed in Jesus actually drives fear away. If that sounds a little bit familiar, we talked about it earlier this summer about how there is no fear in love. That's found in 1 John chapter 4. Well, love is trust. Fear is a total lack of trust. And so if we, if we look at it that way, you know, love is trust and fear is lack of trust. And, and love, the trust that is in love, drives fear away. Actually, when you look at it that way, you know, the real opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is fear. And there is no fear in love. So what are the implications of that in our lives? When we experience that gospel announcement of blessing that says we don't have to fear anymore, it's actually God's perfect love driving out our fear. When God meets us in our poverty and grief, our hunger and failure and drives out our deepest fears, when there's nothing left to fear, then we can be open and honest because we've been forgiven and accepted and redeemed by God 
whose love drives out that fear. We don't need to think of it anymore as, well, there's this side that is our side and that side that is their side. Our righteousness and their heresy, how they got it all wrong, or our good and their, their bad. We don't need to do that anymore because we don't really have to be afraid of those who are other, who are different than us. You see, because they're so much like me. We've been made with the grace of God, and it has healed us. And that's how Jesus leads us from the point of being blessed, even in our deepest needs, to being a blessing to others. Jesus shifts this blessing in subtle ways to, to be about interacting with other people. Those who are merciful, well, then they receive mercy. Those who stop letting the way they're seen by others take up the space of their hearts and drive their decisions. Those with a single-minded passion, well, they're the ones that will see God. And then there are the peacemakers. Already, sort of the groundwork that I've been laying, maybe it suggests to you that we seem to live in a binary world. There are two and only two sides to every question. There are two sides to every group, us and them, the right and the wrong, the true and the, fa and the false. But Jesus has led us to see and has forced us to admit that in any encounter with others, there might be some right in their wrongness and there might be some wrong in our rightness. And when that happens, the old lab labeling categories don't really hold up. I, I find myself actually being able to embrace others right where they are. And why? Well, because God has embraced me right where I am. I, I move to try to bring people together then if I find that we have so much in common. And what is that? Peacemaking. I'm trying to draw these different folks together. So here Jesus has connected peacemaking and bringing people together, or perhaps using some words we also use this summer, um, restoring shalom with being children of God. So, so what does that mean exactly? How is peacemaking something that leads naturally into being a child of God? We're, we're actually helped here because because Jesus uses the same phrase about children of God later in this, this message, right in this very same chapter, only about 30 verses later. Uh, a lot of times when you're looking at scripture and you're trying to say, well, look at one section and say, what does this mean? And if you can find it somewhere else and say, well, does the meaning in that context help inform this first context that I, I'm trying to understand? And so here we have this one just like I said, about 30 verses later in Matthew 5, 43. Let me read that for you. You have heard it said, this is one of Jesus' you have heard it said passages. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then this, pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous that we may be fa children of our Father in heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying, you've heard it said. They always say it. Take sides. Do the same old us and them thing, liberals and conservatives, left and right. Draw the line in the sand. But I tell you, open up your heart and your mind to the other. Try to understand. Try to empathize. Try to Move toward that person who might be so different from you. Step over the line. Straddle it, in fact. And pray for those who persecute you. Wait, pray? <laughs> oh, yeah, those enemies, um, we pray that God will smite them, right? No, to pray for someone is to wish God's best on them. It means, it means I need to stop thinking that I win only if they lose. But why would I want to do this? Oh, that I may be a child of my Father in heaven. That is what Jesus is saying. Love your enemies. 
How, how are you a child of your Father in heaven? Because you are being like your Father in heaven. You're starting to show family resemblance there. This Father in heaven who causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, all of these good things, all of these blessings are gifts from God to everyone. Children of God look like God and they get caught acting like God who blesses everyone. So peacemaking flows naturally from one who is blessed. When God meets us there in that blessing and has been merciful to us, we're inclined to do the same. But the thing is, life is anything but easy for peacemakers. They're advocates on behalf of those who are different on the others. And then they turn right around and they advocate on behalf of somebody on the other side. They're constantly stuck in the middle. They haven't aligned themselves with the side, which draws the ire of everyone from all the sides around them. Because actually choosing sides is a fundamental part of how our world functions. We're supposed to align ourselves with one group and exclude that group. Whose side are you on? What are you for? What are you against? Pick a side already. Because picking sides helps to maintain an illusion that there are those of us who have it right and those who don't. And it's as simple as that. Such a view of the world allows us to project our worst fears on the other team. In this world, your loyalty is supposed to be to your tribe, right or wrong. And if your tribe wants to demonize some other person or some other group, well, you know your responsibility to your tribe. Peacemakers kind of break that mold. If all sides are made up of God's children, then the peacemaker is the one who helps all to see that before they belong to any side, any group, to any tribe, they belong to God. A peacemaker is someone who sees us all as siblings. It's not always easy, because siblings can be especially hard on one another. And maybe that's why next week we need to talk about being persecuted for doing God's work. We're doing the work of love, though, and that breaks down divisions between people, but not without paying a cost, and it's something that we can't do by ourselves. We'd have neither the will nor the ability without God's grace, but once God has met us in the middle of our own badness, it becomes harder and harder for us not to meet others in the midst of theirs. Peacemaking is complicated. It involves bringing two sides together. Peacemakers are the ones who, in the midst of a side-taking world, make the disturbing and the counterintuitive choice to transcend and to include. I'm on both sides. In the ancient world, rain ensured you weren't going to starve. And the sun, well, your crops would grow. And God, for some odd reason, sees fit to send the rain on the just and on the unjust. God extends goodness to all sides. And the peacemakers are the ones who recognize it. They're the ones who, when they extend fairness and blessing to all sides, are the sons and daughters of God carrying on God's heritage. Like I said, though, what does peacemaking lead to? Well, the next beatitude gives us an answer. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing right, for pursuing peace. Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace, and yet his peace is often met with hostility and anger and persecution. He causes division, and eventually he himself is persecuted and killed. You see, peacemaking isn't as simple as doing something and expecting tension to immediately disappear between people. Peacemaking is a process. It takes time. It often involves acknowledging fears and naming the goodness that we see despite our differences in others. Are you involved in some sort of relational conflict today? Could it be office politics or family dynamics? Um, 
place where people are taking sides, but you don't want to be stuck on one side or another. You would want to be a peacemaker. Are, are you in a situation where you see that it's heading down the same old path of division, but you want to be a peacemaker? That could get sticky. It could get difficult. It could even get ugly. But you know that there is a Jesus way to face his relationships that others might have trouble accepting. But that's what peacemaking is. It's living out this beatitude. Now, now, it could be part of any group that you're a part of where you see some of these conflicts. It could be family or work or school or clubs. It could be in your church. There are conflicts that go back farther than anyone can remember. We seem to be pushed to, to choose up sides, to, to join with your friends, support them, and demonize the others. But we know that Jesus' way is calling for peace. So with whom do we need to do some peacemaking? Let's find a way. Like I said, peacemaking is hard work. And it requires reserves of strength that we don't have in ourselves. Let me say that again. Peacemaking res requires reserves of strength we don't have in ourselves. We need to get it from God. And that's how we can do it, especially when people pray. So as we close in prayer, I'm going to do that today for you. Let's pray. Our gracious God, some of those listening today are, they see divisions and conflicts going on around them. And I pray for your strength to be with them, that they might be peacemakers in whatever setting they are in. I pray that they will experience your grace and it will so empower and motivate them that they will just want to see it coming to everyone else's lives. Give them the strength. Give them the patience. Give them the hope and expectation. Give them the vision to see what it would be like in this particular group when conflict is dissolved, is, is swept away, and peace is made between all parties. Lord, we pray for your blessing on us all, that we might grow in that, that ability to see all people as our brothers and sisters, and bring that peace, that peace of shalom uh, to everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this song of thanksgiving because that season is indeed um, upon us. Let us sing that great one, Let All Things Now Living. Let all things now living a song of thanksgiving to God the Creator triumphantly raise, who fashioned and made us, protected and stayed us, who guides us and leads to the end of our days. God's banners fly o'er us, God's light goes before us, the pillar of our shining forth in the night. Till shadows have vanished and darkness is banished, as forward we travel from light into light. The law God enforces the stars in their courses and sun in its orbit obediently shine. The hills and the mountains, the rivers and fountains, the deeps of the ocean proclaim the divine. We too should be 
voicing our love and rejoicing with God adoration a song let us raise till all things now living unite in thanksgiving to God in the highest Hosanna and praise. Amen. How can we bring about that that fact of all things now living, uniting in thanksgiving to our God who blesses us and blesses all. Hey, uh, there are a few announcements to bring. We are in the process. You have received, I'm hoping, your letter from us about our stewardship campaign. Uh, and I invite you to take some time and reflect on what the fellowship of our church has meant to you. Um, I want to hear back from, uh, from you as, as you reflect on that. It's, you know, it's much easier to do that when we're gathered here in person. And, and sometimes you can hear me talking and I can come to you every week. But I miss uh, the opportunity of seeing everybody and getting the feedback. And so... Um, I'm going to be trying to reach out and find, uh, uh, find ways that we can get that. But how has our church been a blessing to you? I invite you to reflect on that, pray on that, and um, read through the materials that you've seen about our church and our hopes and expectations for this coming year. And then invite you to contact us with a, a pledge for the, the year coming up. Hi, everybody. It's Liz. I miss you all. Have a nice week. God bless you. A couple of other announcements that are tied up this week that um, on Wednesday, we will be holding a couple of very carefully socially distanced and protected gatherings at the church. Um, one of them Wednesday at one o'clock will be our women's study. It's not a women's study. It started out as a women's study. Now we're letting uh, anybody come to it. Uh, we are starting volume two of Parables from the Backside. So that's at one o'clock on Wednesday. And then that evening at 6.15, our confirmation students will be gathering, will be meeting here at the church. Those are things on Wednesday. Um, I started out making some announcements about um, the blessings that we have of being part of this fellowship. And every week, uh, as I get the mail or as Mark picks up the mail, we receive some of those blessings in the mail. Thank you for your gifts to the church um, through the snail mail, through our electronic giving. Um, we are blessed. And so I want to take this moment. Let's offer a prayer of thanksgiving and blessing on the gifts that we have received. Gracious God, bless these gifts that we've received that they may be signs of your redemption and your hope to a world in need. Bless our lives that we may shine with your glory and light up the world with your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the love of God, our eternal Father, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Let's sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth in response. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God our Creator, children all are we. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with.
with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it be God bless you this week, folks. Hi, everybody. I'm Fern, and we are just finishing up with our UMW meeting, which was nice to be with the ladies and pastor. Not everybody here, but it's nice to be with those that are. I miss all of you that we don't see on Sunday mornings, and hope that everybody is staying safe, and God bless you.